Hello again folks in 114. Today we're going to be covering section 6-2. There's a calendar just to get around the right here. Uh, today is Wednesday, May 26th, so we're covering section 6-2 per the schedule. Um, just to apologize, the video from yesterday took about 14 hours to upload. <laughs> It's available now if you look for it. The packet that I have for you today uh, consists of this page, this diagram, and some concepts and basically a summary of the formulae. Um, I typed uh, the word problems rather than copied them, so I'm going to walk you through these. And there's a review packet of portion of this that is available that is from this is really from Matt 113 if you had me from 113 we had compiled a list of English words and how they translate to the operations all right if you have to dissect a word problem and create an equation from scratch that is the strategy in tandem with this uh, that I employ myself all right. so if you're interested you need to print that uh, let me turn this on. I'm looking at my computer a lot because I'm not really sure whether it's functional. Looks like it's okay. Okay. Take two. Uh, let me just do all this. This is all thing. All right. Okay. If you hear any banging. They're uh, replacing the roof next door, and, and actually, I live in an apartment that is uh, two adjoined buildings, so the uh, the roof is uh, here. Anyhow, um, let me just briefly show you this. Again, if you had me for Matt 113, I'll make this available. Um, Early in Mat 113, this being Mat 114, of course, um, I tried to compile a, a list of words and what they translate to um, from English into math symbols. So, for example, this is the column pertaining to addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And when you get down here, a little bit further down, it gets a little bit more sketchy. Right? Like, for example, ratios. A ratio is a glorified fraction. Right? If it was just by itself, it represents division, like one number sitting on top of a second number is, can be thought of as the first number divided by the second number. But when you use it as part of an equation, often it is in multiply. Um, similarly, all right, it gets a little bit more vague when you, uh, you see words like total um, in a word problem. All right, this usually implies that you're adding or subtracting things. But depending upon you know the other specifics of the word problem, the unique word problem, there may be more to do. Anyhow, discounts imply subtraction, taxes imply adding the cost to something. Um, some of them are pretty self-explanatory, like plus and minus, what have you. When you see the, the name, essentially the answer of an addition problem, a subtraction problem, a multiplication problem, and a division problem, respectively, just realize that those are the result of at least two things combined. So a sum is something that should be encapsulated in parentheses. It would be two things added usually. All right? Similarly differences, similarly products, and so forth. So make that distinction. If you ever see the word sum, draw a parentheses, a group. Increased by, decreased by, multiplied, so forth. Um, what is obscured slightly, and it's not really an operation, is the, the equal sign. That is usually implied by the word is. All right. That to me is one of the more useful pieces of information. You see an is, draw an equals. If you see a word of, that usually is multiplication. If, however, you see the phrase out of, that usually is division somehow. Even if it's just the ratio itself, like three out of four. And that would be three sitting on top of four. Okay? So little things like that. All right. As for a strategy, um, again, this is what I do personally. Uh, when I try to translate a word problem into uh, an equation or what have you, 
I circled the numbers. I mean, you may not end up using all of them. Sometimes they're there that just as a fun fact about something. I put a box around the operations. If they're do, talking about something that um, seems to be um, uh, like geometry in some way, like area of perimeter, draw a simple picture to summarize. Points of location, it's, it's obscured unfortunately, but point A, point B, point C. Um, again, look for the word is and replace it with an equals. You could borrow a formula, which is really what this section is about, section 6-2. Or you could try to arrange an equation from scratch, right? using those words that were established and things like this. You see is, the words that are before the word is in the word problem, that's one half of your equation. The words after the word is are the right side of your equation, right? things like that. Okay, now let's get into the actual subject here. Uh, which is this diagram you see. Anyway, um, some things you're probably aware of already. First of all, what is a formula? A formula is an equation, but it's a famous equation, right? Like, for example, Einstein's equation equals mc squared, right? which relates energy and mass, basically. Energy and matter. Or maybe practical in some way, right? Uh, like volume is a practical equation, right? So famous in a slightly different context. Right? Um, there are two uh, phrases which are good to know, subscript and superscript, right? And do make the distinction between them. An example of a subscript would be something like the two in the water molecule H2O, right? This is more or less a label it's not telling you that you have to do anything. When you see something like that, a subscript, it's really more a label, or as part of, like, say, um, the slope formula. When you see delta and then y, and then you have subscripts, uh, y sub two, y sub one, over x sub two minus x sub one. These are not telling you that you have to do anything to the y or to this second y. It's just telling you this is the this is the first one, this is the second one, this is the first one, this is the second one. These are labels essentially. And HGO, H2O, um, this isn't really involved the operation either. The, the only sort of exception is in the case of a chemical equation. Um, if you've ever taken chemistry class, you know that they have uh, chemical equations that you are tasked with balancing. So, for example, um, the way that it ends up working out is that it's 2H2, two, um, two molecules of hydrogen gas plus one molecule of oxygen gas would equal two molecules of water. Anyhow. Uh, the amount here is that there's four hydrogens individually here and four here, all right? So there's kind of some multiplication going on there, all right? But for the most part, when you see a subscript, all right, just think label, okay? In this case, which is more the norm in the example of Einstein's equation, when you have a superscript, slightly smaller font raised rather than lowered, um, this is definitely an operation. If you remember from the conversation of order of operations, um, exponents, which is what a superscript really represents, um, is a form of multiplication, a slightly more sophisticated form of multiplication. It has very strict um, instruction. Anyhow, when you think superscript again, think exponent as in an operation. When you think subscript, for the most part, just think of it as a label. It's not like you have to multiply something really. Again, the only sort of mm, uh, defying of that definition would be in the case of balancing a chemical equation. Okay. Um, 
this is maybe a better example, but there is always the one thing that kind of you know, bends the rule a little bit. Anyhow, operations, labels, right? Think of them that way. As to the actual formulas that are in this section, section 6.2, um, these are the ones that are discussed and that are practical to our class. Simple interest, here's me having a little sense of humor for a dollar sign. Simple interest is about um, money earned on investment or owed, as in the case of a loan. Okay, so make that the distinction. And these individual parts, it's just three numbers basically multiplied, but they have a criteria to them, requirements that need to be met. Uh, let's start with T. This was like red, red here. T stands intuitively for time. It's just that time has to be in years. Right? So if they give you something like months instead, you have to translate it to an amount of years. So say, for example, they've discussed 18 months. Right? How much time is that in terms of years? It's 18 divided by 12, right? which is one and a half. Right? Um, the R value here is what would be referred to as a rate, a percentage rate. If you have a percentage rate, just remember from earlier, you can either translate this to a fraction, which is very often more practical, or the decimal equivalent of the, of the percentage. Okay. The actual money that is involved here, and I reluctantly will use green, is um, this value that would sit here. Well, that actually writes today. This is known as the principal. And principal is a fancy way of saying the original amount of money. So I'm going to put a dollar sign here, just sort of exaggerate. I put it in green intentionally, as green as in money. All right, anyhow, simple interest is all these three factors multiplied. All right, I for interest and specifically simple interest. The original amount of money at the percentage rate for the certain amount of time will equate to money earned on investment or money that is owed as in the case of a loan. All right, sorry for the sloppiness. All right. Volume of a rectangular solid is fairly, you know, familiar to everybody, right? When you're talking about volume of a rectangular solid, um, you mean the amount of space that is contained uh, by a rectangular solid. So I'm a little short on colors, so I'm just going to write the word space on the inside of this box, right? Uh, very often when you're teaching little kids and you're discussing the subject of area, which you notice there's the area formula right there, these first two factors, a kid will mistakenly use the word space when they try to validate their uh, uh, suspicion about a problem. They'll say, hey, when you want me to calculate the area, you want me to get the space inside, right? And you should go, yes, that is essentially what I mean, but use, but add to that, say, space is the word that we use specifically for three-dimensional objects. Surface is the word that we use for areas, which are two-dimensional, okay? So when you think volume, remember, that's really 3D, and we should use this word when we're talking about the inside of it, all right? V for volume is a space. All right, now the individual uh, factors that you see here are intuitively at length. This cooperates. Uh, a width. And it's usually H as for a height. But it can technically be depth as well. Alternatively. Okay? So not too much of a difference here in terms of what's actually going on. They just have different purposes. So we've changed the labels, all right? Length, width, height, as opposed to principal, rate, and time, all right? 
And when you get over here to z-score, this is from statistics. This will be important when we get to chapter 12. Statistics. Right. Essentially what a z-score is calculated for is this. This corresponds to an area. And the area corresponds to a percentage. And the percent percentage corresponds or correlates to a probability. It is in fact a ratio, right? as you can see there's this line here, right? It's a ratio of these parts. The, um, the value that is written as an X here is one individual data value. The uh, very highly stylized looking U, which is pronounced Mu, it's a Greek character, all right, is the mean all right, of a population. Uh, essentially, the, what is that? That is the basically the average of all data. And this highly stylized looking O here is a lowercase sigma. And this is the standard deviation. Right. The standard deviation is basically a sort of average of distances to and from the mean. Right. You're not really responsible to grasp it to that degree, but it's something that will come back when my knee really hurts. I'm sorry. I'm leaning on it. This will be revisited in, again, chapter 12, which is the end of the semester. That's in a couple of weeks. Uh, and it's for statistics. So they're introducing it in section, uh, in chapter 12, uh, pardon me, in, in section 6-2 now, just so that it's a little bit warmer, a little bit fuzzier when we get there, you know, as in, you know, comfortable. All right. All right, so it's just two things multiplied, divided by something else, essentially. All right, they each have a job, and you could be content with that, all right? One individual data value, and there is a typo here, actually. Uh, right. I'll have to fix this before I mail it to you. Yep. You should, there should be a subtraction symbol there. I'm very sorry. All right. This is a minus. You subtract your individual data value from the mean to figure out how far apart they are. And then you divide by the standard deviation, which is something like an average, right, of all of the individual data values to and from the mean. All right, so it gives you this ratio, right? And again, this ratio corresponds to an area, which correlates to a percentage, which can be translated to a probability, okay? Myself, and I have to edit that. Uh, dope. Shouldn't have done that. All right. This is what happens when you stay up late at night. <laughs> Make little typos and things. Last thing is <clears throat> the slope-intercept form of the line equation. If you've taken algebra in high school, you've probably seen this before. Um, this is what my knee hurts. All right. uh, y, which is one half of a coordinate, an ordered pair, is equal to m, 
uh, times x, the coefficient of x, and plus b. All right, it's these two that are the slope, right, which is basically the pitch, the, the incline of the line, incline of the line, and the intercept of this equation. Right. This is uh, an intercept. Specifically, it's a y-intercept. Right. A y-intercept is more or less think of it like um, a starting point. Right. That would be a practical way of thinking it. Uh, it. Officially, what it is is where the line. If you had a graph. It's where the line would cross the uh, the y-axis. Okay. Crosses y-axis if it is a y-intercept. Therefore, it is a, an ordered pair. So it would be zero always to the x value, and then whatever the b happens to be. All right. Now that's thinking in more of a mathematician's way of thinking which is that a line could be extended backward, right? In ordinary practical applications, say in business, um, there is no second quadrant, you know? Uh, so again, that's why I say you can kind of think of it as being something like a starting point, right? In a practical way, your line for your uh, business uh, would start here, right on the axis. Math world is anything and anything is theoretically possible. All right, business math is a little bit more limited. Okay, so I do make those distinctions. Um, there, again, there should be a minus here, not a multiplication dot. All right, and everything else is fair and square. I'm gonna have to edit that before I upload it uh, to Canvas, all right? Let us try to do some word problems now. Let's see if I can brighten that good. And I'll switch over to the examples now. Yeah. Let me clear this up. Fatima borrows $4,000 at simple interest. Now, a word problem should say that. They should, it, it should say simple interest because in theory there's something, a different formula not responsible for called compound interest, all right, uh, which involves um, exponents. Anyhow, she borrows $4,000 at simple interest of 2.9% for three years, all right? Answer these in two parts. Number one, or A, what, how much will Fatima pay in interest by the end of the three years? Well, you need to resurrect that formula. I equals P times R times T, and substitute the values. Right. What would be practical, right. and maybe I should do this up here because I have a little bit more space to work. Um, is to maybe write this in the style of a fraction, right? As you insert the values here. All right, and I'll put the solution here instead. Uh, here's what I mean. All right, remember what I was saying before. The this is the percentage rate, so it's the R value. But being that it is a percentage, you could write it in the style of a fraction, or you could write it in the style of a decimal. Before you multiply, you really have to pick one or the other. Because we're talking about money that is borrowed, um, it's often a round number. Like most people don't, when they go for a loan, now go, I'd like to borrow twenty-five dollars and sixty-five cents. <laughs> you know, the, it's not usually a small amount of money to begin with, but it usually um, is, to, you know, 
terminates at the uh, dollar, you know, and it, so zeros. A nice round number. No change, nothing unusual, like 47.50 or whatever. Uh, pardon me, uh, 47.53. So let me just insert this value in place of P here, the principal. That's the original amount of money. And we're going to multiply next. Um, being that the case, when we choose to convert this 2.9% to a fraction or a decimal, right, we could either make it 0 0.029, which I think is probably what a person would do if you have um, a calculator handy, right? and that would be practical in this case. Uh, no one could fault you for that. Right. Or you could write it as 2.9 over 100. Right, because it's a percent, right? Which means that it's per 100, meaning that it's sitting on top of 100. The only difference between looking at it this way and looking at it this way with the decimal scooted over is that you have actually divided in this case, whereas this is more a superficial division. Right? The advantage to writing something in the style of a fraction, you'll see now, and I'll do it both ways. Being, uh, it, you know, if you have a number that is a r nice round number, you could do some simplification. Is what I'm really getting at. Right. It will spare you a little bit of trouble when you're doing the calculations by hand, at least. All right. Then there's time. Right. Three years. That would be uh, situated here. All right. In place of t, because it's already is good. All right. Now, if you set it up like so, you can give everything a denominator if necessary, by putting ones underneath, right? And then, as I said, if you wrote, if you took the time to write 2.9% in the style of a fraction, it would naturally be 100, and then you could pull some tricks. You could cross simplify, essentially, which is to divide by a GCF without really consciously thinking about it too hard. If this is 100, and this is a nice round number above the line, and this is below the line, and you cross this out, leave a one behind, and then cross out two of these. Two zeros, two zeros. That leaves you with just ones on the bottom, which is, again, superfluous. You don't really need to multiply these. You would just get one. And then you'd just be left with 40 and 2.9 times three. And since it's just multiplication, you can strategically multiply in any order that you feel comfortable. So for example, if this is three and really four, that makes that 12 with a zero, right? Three times 40 is 12 with a zero, 120. Then you would just have to multiply 120 times 2.9, which doing it by hand is not too arduous, right? If you were going to do that, right? It's an easier process, right? I've kind of like uh, got myself in trouble, so I might as well go ahead and do it brute force, all right? Zero times nine is zero, two times nine is 18, carry the one, nine times one plus one is 10, place holder, two times zero is zero, two times two is four, two times one is two, zero, eight, four, three, here. Number of decimal places to move over, one. So the value of how much money uh, Fatima should pay an interest by the end of three years uh, would be $348. Right. There's nothing wrong, certainly, with, again, you could convert this to a decimal and then just compute, you know, type five, uh, pardon me, type 4,000 times 0 0.029 times three and everything is fair and square. But you should get this value, okay? So three hundred forty-eight dollars. Right. Um, what is the total amount she will pay the bank by that time? Now, what this is implying total—it's an operation—is that you're either going to add or subtract. Right. If we're talking about money that is essentially owed to whoever the, the bank is, all right. It's the let's call this A as an amount, 
is equal to the principal plus the interest. This is another formula that's famous. The account value or all that is owed is equal to the principal, same figure for 1,000 plus I, now the interest that was calculated. So um, that makes this 4,000 plus 348, and that value would be 3,000, pardon me, 4,348 total. Okay. Not too bad, right? Just realize that is often the case with math. You have options. Right. And don't try to talk a little kid out of it either. Like, you know, when if you're in the position of teacher, you know, if they have an intuition about something, if you have time, you know, you can give them the attention that they deserve. All right, start with their intuition, right? So take it as far as you can, then bring it to their attention that, well, there may be another way to do this and perhaps it's slightly more efficient, all right? There's a lot of patience that you need when you're teaching, right? And time is really the, uh, of the essence. All right, now let's look at the next one. Number two, use the formula for the volume of a rectangular solid to calculate the width of a box of ice cream. Known dimensions given are seven inches long, 3.5 inches tall, and 122.5 inches cubed in volume. So we're going to find the width specifically. Let me erase the obstruction here. And we'll start with this. This is going to require a little bit of rearranging algebraically. That's really the point of the exercise. But let me just uh, set a good example and uh, do what I had suggested you do. All right. You have a volume of a rectangular solid to calculate. So this is the formula that we're going to borrow rather than ortho. Volume equals length times width times height. All right. And we're going to specifically uh, solve for width, which means we would have to rearrange this. Right. Um, make a note, perhaps. Rearrange to solve for w. This is talking about a box of ice cream. If you'd like, you can simulate a box of ice cream by drawing it. And fill in with other information you know. Um, it is seven inches long, so perhaps this dimension from here to here, seven inches. Um, 3.5 inches tall, which is more or less the height dimension. And it's 122.5 inches cubed in volume, which is referring to basically the, the space that it is taking up. So I'll just put that on the inside, inches cubed. Sometimes it's good to basically draw a picture and if, if you're not really quite sure what you have to do, draw a picture to summarize based upon the description and add the little tidbits of information to the drawing as you go along. Right. It isn't especially necessary in this case because it's not too complicated a problem. But, and they do specify, they want to know what the width is, calculate the width. Um, it's just basically out of whack. Normally, you are given these three figures, right? The, the length, the width, and the height specifically. But instead, you're given the volume, which means, again, you have to rearrange to solve for W. You can do that up front. That is just using these symbols. Or you could plug in the numbers that you have and then rearrange them, right? Either way is fine, all right? I'll do that down here. If V is equal to L times W times H. And we have this much information. We have, I'm just going to put the values 122.5. Um, 
seven for the length, and 3.5 for the height. Notice that we have this one value here in the middle that is unaccounted for. Right? When it comes to solving algebraic equations, remember the name of the game is opposite operations. So if you want to move something somehow over equals, even if it's more than one thing, you're going to perform opposite operations. Right. You can do them in tandem. When you get comfortable, you could be a little bit more strategic right, and do uh, several things at once. If not, go slow. Right? Just realize that if you're trying to essentially solve for W, you have to freeze that in place in this case. Right? So if it makes you happier, right, throw a little box around this and go, that thing, everything has to move around it. It's going to be lead and it's just going to stay, sit there. All right, so I'm going to move these things systematically by performing opposite operations. What is the opposite of multiplying in general? It's to divide. So if I want to move the 7 and the 3.5, either one of them first, right, over this equals, then I'm going to divide by those things. So you'll divide by 3.5, and there'll be a cancellation effect. And if you did it there, you must do it here as well. And if I want to move 7 eventually, or in tandem, that is at the same time, you would also divide by 7. There would similarly be a cancellation effect, and it's going to the same place. So down here. Being that these two things are situated next to each other on the same tier, and as, essentially as a denominator, they have multiplied. They were multiplied to begin, to begin with over here, and they got moved systematically over to the opposite side. So they're still multiplied because they're on the same level, right, as opposed to on opposing levels. That means that this is now rearranged to solve for W. 122.5 over 3.5 times 7. All right, you can enter this into your calculator. 122.5. Hit the division symbol, and then if you're crafty, um, incorporate uh, parentheses to spare yourself uh, any bit of trouble. That's a, supposed to be a 5, sorry. All right, here's what I mean. I'll need a uh, pull out the uh, trusty TI-30X. Right. In theory, you have this calculator. Turn it on first. All right, now, if you're gonna do this um, quickly, or efficiently, 122.5 is what you would enter first, because it is on top, then hit the division symbol. And then to be careful, to make sure that your calculator understands that this is the denominator entirely. All right, incorporate these parentheses, all right, to encapsulate both of these parts here. So 3.5 times 7, and then, of course, close the parentheses. If you don't use the parentheses in this case to group these two things as the denominator, what might happen is that it will calculate 122.5 divided by 3.5 only, because it's written first, and then multiply by seven as an antithought. And you should, in theory, get a different answer. Anyhow, this is what you would get. Five, and that is correct. Okay, so the way that this works out is that this is five. If you want, um, you could reason it through two ways. All of the units involved here are inches in some degree. All right, this is first degree, first degree, and this being a volume is degree three. If you were to, and I would only do this as an afterthought as well, um, incorporate them into the formula here. Inches cubed would be where 122 is. Inches here and inches here would in theory be multiplied, which means that in terms of the units strictly, this would be inches squared underneath inches cubed. Now you may or may not remember, but 
when you are dealing with the exponents, I'll put this in a little thought cloud here. If it was x cubed over x squared, you would subtract these according to the quotient rule for exponents. And that would produce x to the first, which is something that people don't bother to write normally, like a one. But you could. Now granted, that is for a variable, but you could do the same, you basically apply the same principle to a unit, right? Which is an abbreviation for inches in this case, right? So this would end up rightfully being inches first degree, right? For your width. Okay? If you wanted to do it piecemeal, that is, figure out what this is simply by itself, 3.5 times 7 first, you can do that, all right? The only time that you really should be kind of avoiding doing things intermittently um, or in between um, is if you have something that is an irrational number like the square root of 2 because you don't want to round in the middle of your calculation. Right? So it's good to sort of rig the machine, set up the controls first, and then get your calculator to uh, give you a high degree of precision without rounding. Okay. Now here's an example of that statistics formula from earlier. It's just a little bit more involved in this particular incarnation of it. But don't be deterred. It's uh, just maybe more intense, scary looking than it is in real life. Okay. Um, this is a slightly more complex version statistics formula, all right? What you have here is um, X bar. X bar is mean of a uh, sample, all right? And in this case, sample mean, and mu is population mean. Right? This is still the standard deviation, and that is, um, uh, number of data points, I believe, so n. Anyhow, uh, this is just an exercise in substitution uh, to calculate the z squared z. You don't have to rearrange anything, you just have to be very careful about um, uh, where you put things. So, here's z. I'm gonna write this in green because I can superimpose on top of green a bit easier. That is the one benefit to having a green marker that doesn't write very well. It's just faint enough to be useful. Square root of n. Okay, so the given values are um, the x bar um, sample mean is 120. So you would put 120, I'll put this in black, this will be a little bit easier to see, would go right here in the formula, mu, which is pronounced essentially mu, mu, all right? The population mean uh, is 100, so you're gonna subtract 100 here. The standard deviation the sort of average uh, of distances to and from the mean is 16, so you would put that underneath these. And then this n value is the number of data values, I believe, uh, is four. So four goes inside this square root. Okay. Now you could, if you want to, um, enter this into your calculator straight away, right? 
this is a square root, but it ends up being the square root of a perfect square, so you get a whole number. You don't have to worry about anything needing to be rounded. Um, or just sort of work it slowly. All right. What you would need to do is basically go through the process of, since we're just strictly working with this one side, if you are just uh, basically uh, strictly working the right side here, you're really just um, working in expression. And therefore, you're going to use the order of operations. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, Kem Das, Gems, whichever you prefer. Which means in the case of something that is rational, as you see this line here is a rational expression, you're gonna straighten out the top independently. You're gonna straighten out the bottom independently. And then if it is possible, divide as, a, as an antithought, right? If there was some kind of division up above the line, which there is not, all right, then you would follow the order of operations very strictly in that sense. Similarly over here as well, that's technically division. All right. But um, you're going to be fine if you just basically convince yourself this is a rational expression. So it's not really breaking the rule of order of operations. It's just being um, doing an extra division at the end if necessary. So. Let's straighten out the top first. What is 120 minus 100? This is just 20. What is, that's above the line here, because I need the space. That is as much as you could do with the top. Down on the bottom, you see 16 essentially divided by the square root of 100. Now, technically, if you follow the order of operations and your focus is down here now as an eyeball the focus should you divide first or should you take a square root first which is higher order according to the order of operations the square root is a type of um, exponent really it would be an exponent to the half uh, degree anyhow we're gonna have to do this first so what's the square root of four? It's two. So this is really 16 divided by two, which means that overall 16 divided by two is eight. You'd have an eight down here. Um, and then you can you know, divide 20 by eight and get a decimal. Well, you could try to whittle it down first. That's my inclination. Um, in either case, this will calculate the z-score that we're looking for here. All right. Um, I'm going to try to reduce it first. You don't have to do it this way, but uh, the common factor of these is uh, 2, or rather 4, that GCF. So 8 divided by 4 would be reduced this to 2. Um, 20 divided by 4 would be 5. 5 divided by 2, the leftovers, would produce 2.5. That's the value, 2.5. All right. All right, for your z-score. Again, what is a z-score? It, it's basically this train of thought. From a z-score, you can basically determine an area. And from the area, you could determine a percentage. And from that percentage, you could basically determine a probability. All right, this is for statistics. Again, you'll revisit this in chapter 12. All right, if you don't feel super comfortable about it right now, don't feel bad, all right? It takes a lot of, uh, exa a lot of examples to really get a uh, jazz for it. Okay. One more. Don't break the righty, Hayden. Okay. All right, the slope-intercept form of a line equation is y equals mx plus b for the slope of m. What on earth did I do here? Oh, soft M. I've got too much gobbledygook in the way here. This is not inputting values, it's just practicing um, rearranging it to solve for a particular variable. Okay. So
So solve for n essentially means isolate m. All right. Notice it's in the middle. That means that you have to move the stuff around it. I'm going to put this over here because it's a bit more space, and I'll make it larger. If we're going to solve for m, we're going to get the m alone, essentially. Isolated is another way of saying that. Um, so I'll put a little box around m, and that's going to be frozen in place. And these other things, eventually, will be carted over here. Being that they have to be taken over equals, remember that you're, when you start moving things from one side to another, it's either right to left or left to right, you have to perform the opposite operation to accomplish that. To move over equals. Right. Now, which of these should you do first? It's uh, exactly the opposite of the order of operations. Normally in the order of operations, you do the multiplication bef or the division before you do the addition or subtraction. When you're performing opposite operations, most of the time, what you end up doing is the adding or subtracting first, and then the multiplication or division that is involved second. That's the way it would work in this instance. So, um, we'll do that. Let me draw a little bit of uh, scaffolding here. We have our designated right side and left side. And I'm going to do the adding or subtracting portion of movement first. So I'm going to move the B first. What is the opposite of adding something, even if you don't know what it is? Subtracting that mysterious thing. So if I subtract here for the sake of moving it, then I would really have to do that down here as well. And you might get a little vexed and say, well, I don't know what the B is. You don't have to know what it is. You just have to be able to justify moving it. And that would be, if this was plus three, then you would subtract three and you wouldn't bat an eyelash. All right? Don't be intimidated by the fact that this is a letter right now. All right? Something minus itself, even mysterious, will cancel out of existence. Which means that what is left here now is the M that we're trying to isolate. Um, next to this X. And on the opposite side, I can't actually combine Y with the B because we don't know what either of those values are. So if we don't know what they're worth, then rather than stack them, we could kind of hawk them next to each other, more or less horizontally rather than vertically. Right? That's an accomplishment, believe it or not. Now, we've done this portion of opposite operations for the sake of rearranging. Now we will engage in the opposite of multiplying or dividing, depending upon what is here. Right? If we are going to basically freeze that in position, then I have to move the x now rather than move the m. Usually that's a coefficient and it would be exactly the opposite situation. But what is going on in between two things that are pressed together, it is understood that they are multiplied. So if I want to justify moving either of those parts, I have to move them by the opposite of multiplying, which is to do which? To divide by, in this case, x. And if you did it there, you do it to the entire other side, not just one or the other, both at the same time you're going to divide by x. Something, even something mysterious, divided by itself, with the exception of zero, cancels, essentially. And that leaves you with your answer. Solve for the slope m. I'm just going to write it on the left side. It doesn't matter which, right? m would be equal to y minus b over x. And that would be your answer. Okay. It's just a mental exercise in rearranging stuff algebraically. Okay, no substitution in this case. All right. I think that's it. Good. 
All right, so uh, what we'll do is turn this off. Come on. And put this off. Just to remind you, uh, a homework in my lab, we want to work on section 6.2 now. Okay? now. And that's that. I'm going to upload the video and correct the little typo that I have and everything should be available to you uh, by three o'clock. Okay. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Be careful out there.